Hackathon Showcase. Um, yay. So here, uh, what we're doing is presenting uh, lightning talk style presentations of what was accomplished at the hackathon. Uh, just a little bit of details about what happened at the hackathon for anyone that wasn't there. Uh, we had 200 participants. Uh, we had a 24-hour hacking room throughout Wikimania. Uh, we had 26 breakout sessions alongside the hacking. We had a mentoring program. Uh, we had a skill share program. We had a volunteering program where actually 62% of the participants signed up in advance to help with volunteering roles related to the log logistics. Um, and then, of course, everyone else is volunteering as well, but just logistically, that, that was pretty cool. Um, and then we also had some tasks for non-technical participants. So here in the showcase, uh, Seaburn will explain a little bit about how it will work, uh, and we're looking forward to it being awesome. Yeah, you can set up. Um. OK, well, welcome. Please find a seat. Uh, my first request is that uh, all of the presenters um, try and be in this area, uh, in the etherpad. Um, we have uh, lined up about 15, uh, maximum three minute presentations for you. Uh, presenters will have a clock here visible that will count down. And I think there's some uh, special light effects with green, yellow, and red lights. Um, so yeah, make it really long if you want to see the red light, I guess. Um, in between the sessions, uh, we're going to uh, uh, change presenters, and there's often going to be a, like a laptop change, so that might uh, uh, give you some time to uh, digest whatever you heard in the three minutes before that. Um, the, the, the laptop change is a part of, uh, of, of your three minutes' time uh, to the presenters. Uh, presenters, also, please be aware that uh, there's some non-technical audience uh, here, and um, yeah, whatever you're uh, explaining should be understandable, um, well, also for me, for example. Um, the sessions are recorded. Um, is, are there any presenters that don't want to be videotaped? Yeah, OK, then um, yours will be last. Please uh, contact uh, Rachel, and we'll stop the video recording before you go on stage. Um, Dirk Jan, uh, you're first. Plug-in. What's the cable? <laughs> what do you need? HDMI. HDMI. Um, oh, we had that before. So I dropped it on the floor. Ah, Here's okay. That explains. HDMI. Thank you. There we go. Let's see. Does it come up? Okay. Seems a bit shaky. Let us try it. I'm holding that, and I don't have to. Where are we? Okay, so we've, um, you might be familiar with coordinates in Wikipedia pages. We have them often here in the corner, as well in the info box. Um, when you click them, you go here, pardon me, or you go back and you, stupid thing, oh well, or you have this like nice pop-up over here, so you actually have a map within the page. Um, on Wikipedia, on the mobile website, we don't actually have this, you go here and then you need to find the coordinates, which is a very complicated process, if I can do it at all. Where is it? Oh, there we are. Look. So useful. And then you get this page. So nice. Um, so what I was working on is to integrate some of the maps work that we've been doing in the past. And I've integrated this into the mobile website. So there's now a button here. And if you click it, you get this. Fancy. And the same within the info box as well, actually. So, and well, harder to show. But. And this feature is uh, available now on the site. 
Uh, is that correct? It is available now if I turn it on, like just after I get on stage, yes. Okay, next. Next person. Cool, thank you. Uh, next one is uh, Kunal Mehta, um, who worked together with uh, two other people on the screenshots in the installer. Do you have, what do you need? Uh, this one? Any display? Yeah. Okay, hello. Um, when you want to install MediaWiki, this is the screen you see. It tells you what version of MediaWiki you're installing and then gives you a link to in install it. Um, and then, uh, then you end up at a pa page here. It asks you like what your language is and stuff and then asks you a bunch of questions and eventually you end up at a page that looks like this. Um, it asks you like whether you want an open wiki, blah, blah, blah. Um, what license you want, some email stuff, and then you come down here to skins, okay? And if you've never used MediaWiki before, or even if you're not like an experienced MediaWiki person, you'll see these words like monobook and vector, and you'll be totally confused as what they mean, and it's asking you which one you want the default to be. So um, with some work with myself, Izara, and Bartosz, we added functionality to an installer that it now includes screenshots of each skin. So if you want to know what you know, modern looks like, um, you can, yeah, there's a, just a demo page which shows the, like an example page and some public domain images. So this can be distributed. And for skins that are fully responsive, like timeless, um, there can be multiple screenshots, and I think the fourth one is the mobile view. Yeah, and so it shows shows like what the what the mobile view is, and so there are different screenshots for like every resolution it supports. Um, yeah, and this is hopefully going to be like the first step for including more information about skins and extension in the installer. So like some next steps will be um, descriptions um, or like other thing or some other information that we have about the extension metadata like license and stuff. And then I have one other demo that I didn't tell Seaburn about that I wanted to show. Do I still have time? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Your okay. on the, on the so, and in which uh, version of MediaWiki will the installer screenshots be enabled? Uh, the next one, which is 1.30. Okay. So like, like many of us, we, um, when developing MediaWiki code, we use this tool called Code Sniffer. Um, and Code Sniffer, what it does is it goes through like your PHP code and it applies some like different rules and stuff um, just to make sure the syntax is valid and it catches some common errors. Or like in PHP, there are like a few functions that can do the same exact thing, but the function is called two different things. So you know, we picked one function name and then it enforces that. And also like it's for a lot of the common errors, it can fix the code. So that way for like newcomers to MediaWiki, um, you know, they can just run the fixed code and it'll automatically apply the style. Um, so at the hackathon, we made one big improvement to it. It's now called Goat Sniffer. Thank you. Wonderful. Okay, um, the third presentation is by uh, Ron Katau on push notifications for Echo. All right, so in, um, let me get my mouse cursor over to the other side. Here we go. So in MediaWiki, um, we have notifications that will tell you when certain things happen, like when people thank you for your edits or respond to you or do various things. Um, and we have our own notification system, and it's kind of tied into email, but there's not a super convenient way for you to get uh, notifications in close to real time. Um, so um, I decided to fulfill an old request and implement push notifications using the Web Push API for notifications. 
So this adds a, a column here, to, a third column here to the preferences, and you can decide which types of notification you want to get push notifications for. And then when someone, for example, um, hold on, I'll have to show you what I'm doing before I, before I do it. Um, I'm just going to mirror my displays real quick. Fine. So then when someone um, reverts your edit, say, then you should receive, um, once this goes through, my computer's a bit slow, you will receive a notification from your browser over here, which will tell you that your edit was reverted and who did it, et cetera. Um, Furthermore, if you know someone adds a thing to your talk page, um, <laughs> hey, I, I'm, I'm yelling at myself. I'm allowed. <laughs> then you'll get a notification, and there's a link to the user page of the person who just uh, hated on you, and there's a link to the changes as well. And you can click all these links; they're the same as in the main notification, and they'll open a new tab in your browser. Uh, so we'll have to do a bit more work before this is actually production ready because it uses a library that is terrible and has hundreds of dependencies and um, we need to figure out a way for you to turn this off again once you've opted into it because that would be nice. Um, and to manage multiple subscriptions because you can also use this on your phone um, and it'll show you notifications um, through the browser app on your phone as well. Um, and it's so you can have multiple devices that you receive notifications on. Uh, you can have multiple browsers on different computers. So you need to be able to manage your subscriptions and unsubscribe again and all that. And I haven't built any of that yet. But this is a proof of concept and it works pretty well. Thank you, Rowan. Next is uh, Katie Horn. So this is obviously not code or a project that is finished. Um, and that is because if I were to show you how far we got, it would just be a big fancy stack trace. And you've either seen enough of those already this weekend or don't know what they are. So uh, the general idea that we are trying to get to with plantdata.io, which is not represented there, um, the first wild idea is, hey, you have a sensor. You can put it out somewhere. You have a piece of land or a balcony or something, and you want to grow a plant. And you don't know anything about plants, so what plant should you get? Well, maybe we can plug some environmental data into Wikidata or something like Wikidata and get a list back of things that will work with whatever you have. Kind of cool. Um, at some point along the line, we decided that, you know, maybe this data should not go into Wikidata itself. We really should have our own instance of Wikibase that would handle all of these things so we could sort of have all the properties that we care about. We could have cultivars that are like a little more detailed than they want to get right now. But do it in such a way that if Wikidata ever decides they want what we have, we could import it fairly easily. So, so far, so good. Uh, we spent the last, well, since Wednesday, um, Erica, Buna, and myself uh, basically looking for documentation on how to do any of these things that probably doesn't exist yet because, yeah, it's, it's sort of a new thing to try. So, yeah. Uh, oh, darn it. Well, you saw it anyway. Uh, <laughs> but we are going to continue to push on this. We've learned uh, an awful lot about how all of these systems go together. And I think we're still very optimistic about being able to get something for the next hackathon. So stay tuned. Thanks. Thank you, Rachel. And because I don't have my laptop, I kind yeah. of didn't know who was next. We have Jarl, or yep. also Polish. known as Pavel, yes. uh, with a Polish uh, last name, I think. Yeah. yeah that I cannot <laughs> pronounce. <laughs> so, never mind. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, a quick story: Why it's sharing? Uh, why? 
How can I duplicate my screen actually with this? Oh, I need to drag it. Oh, that's so bad. Okay. That's. You want me to help you? Yes, please. Yes. Okay. Go here. Preferences, display preferences, and then you enable. Okay. Uh. In the monitors, you enable the, the mirror. Clone. Oh, that's so good. Yes, perfect. Okay, so quick story behind wh what I've done during the hackathon. So uh, for this year, uh, Wikilove's Monuments uh, will collaborate with Flickr. Um, so the Flickr community is doing something called Flickr Photo Walks. And uh, because, uh, well, we want to help them a little, uh, I've created some basic applications, uh, basic application for finding the monuments that, that they can photograph and then upload to Flickr, and we will take care of uh, taking pictures from Flickr to Wikimedia Commons so we can like share the same goal. So uh, what we can do is um, share and uh, search for any city where the event is, and we will have a map of a li with a list of monuments and dots on the map that corresponds with the numbers uh, on the map. So. Uh, if they want to like take them up with them, they can simply click uh, print, and they will share. They will say, uh, they will have like the um, printable version of the list of monuments, so they can they can basically um, do, 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 have the PDF that they can like take with them or print this. So that's it. <laughs> Next, we have uh, Isara with the timeless skin. Here you go. Here you go. Yeah, so we deployed the timeless skin to MediaWiki.org and to test wikis, which makes this the first volunteer developed skin to be deployed on Wikimedia production possibly ever. I don't even know how the others originally were because, uh, well, Vector was like in 2009. Okay, Monobook in 2004 was the previous one. I think it's modern too. So yeah, this is the skin and it, it works in mobile and stuff. So it, this is fairly low resolution, but can you zoom out? Yes, so it actually, it fills the space if there's more space and it gets a lot, it, it collapses if you have less space. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, next we have Muriel, as far as I can tell. Do you need HDMI too? Yes. <laughs> I'll apologize in advance. I talked a lot, so I lost my voice. So that means it was awesome, though. Ah, uh, hang on. I'm gonna mirror my screen. Okay. All right, so. <clears throat> oh my. That is not good. Wait. <sighs> okay. Well, that's. We're going to stick to that, I think. You can see anything? All right, so. I'm starting out with this. Uh, you don't really need to understand what's going on here. But uh, what I was working on is um, there's a concept online related to the gender gap that we keep on talking about the gender gap and that the fact that we don't have a lot of articles about women and that we need to keep on working on those. But there's another concept of the gender gap that sometimes we work on articles about women 
or men, um, and the way that we write about them is different. So what I've been working on is called the concept replacer, um, and it's on a user script right now. Um, so what it does is you go to any article on Wikipedia, and you can just decide to switch the concept. So if I click this now, uh, and it will demo work. There we go. So now I'm reading about a man instead of reading about a woman. And what that does psychologically is that we can start reading. And if it, if it feels like something is a little weird, then maybe the article is not neutral. For example, for Ada Lovelace, um, we can see that in the first paragraph, we're reading about, um, you know, uh, chiefly known for his work on Charles Babbage's proposed mechanical general purpose, la la la. And that's the first sentence. And I was looking at it and I was like, hmm, that doesn't usually read as a guy putting up uh, you know, the work of his wife on the first sentence. I wonder if Charles Babbage uh, is, you know, has his wife on the first sentence as the answer, as you can expect, is no. Uh, in fact, Adel Lovelace is uh, like way, way down on that page for Charles Babbage. So that, um, that is a good way to kind of like look and see and you know, that there is um, some things that maybe are not entirely neutral. Uh, you can do this to any article. The fun thing about this tool is that you can also do this outside um, of Wikipedia. Um, you know, there's a WikiHow article about how to treat girls and women that can show you how it might not be very, um, I don't know, uh, neutral uh, if you translate it to uh, boys and men. Um, and there's a, there's a whole bunch of those uh, kind of concepts online. Um, how does a girl show respects to a boy? I mean, when it's read, re read in its original form, it looks so innocent, and then when you switch it, it's not. So hopefully, um, this can help us kind of read articles and see if um, we need to maybe be more neutral in our writing. Thanks. Um, when, when do you expect this to become available? Next steps I was going to say, uh, I need to clean up the code because as you know, uh, hackathons is you know dirty code. Uh, I need to clean it up, I need to make sure that it works and then hopefully it will be a user script you can pull from my um, account or a gadget if you want it. Thank you, Mario. Um, for the next presentation, I have to declare a conflict of interest. Um, I, w I was involved in it, um, it, it it's neat. Uh, that's, that's all I can say, it's about the codification. And this is uh, Birgit and Fish. Let's go. Hello, computer. Okay. Oh. I think this needs improvement. Oh no! <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! What a terrible but, mistake! <laughs> but, but now comes the improvement. Wait, Can someone please wait, create wait a fab for task for this? Uh, uh, Can you mirror uh, the thing yeah. again? Yeah, you, you know goats are the new cats, cats right? Uh, uh, sorry. Yeah, that's that's why now we will this is all planned. Yes. <laughs> we will see the improvement to that. Ah, okay. That's the one. Thanks. Yeah, so. forgot what you just saw. Okay. Good afternoon. Forget, good afternoon. Forget about the cats because goats are the new cats, as you might have noticed in the last two days. Because we were quite, have been quite active, and now we want to show you what you can gain from that. So that's an awesome logo of the goatification movement. I I can call it a movement not now. I think. Um, made by Brian Davis. Um, everywhere you see it, you uh, can notice, okay, this is part of the codification movement. Of course, we are um, software developer and tech people, so we have a workboard on Fabricator. Go check it out and let's go. Um, every great movement needs a goat of arms, obviously, so that's our goat of arms. And also for use on Wiki, we have an awesome barn star with a logo in it by Cameron 11598. 
we also have a Twitter account. Um, so source code, that's a, that's the one you should look like. Um, we have, uh, I think we even have more followers now. So it's it's uh, up this since two days. So um, it's really it's really a thing. And the first tweet, Birgit said, "Let there be goats," and lo, there were goats. And Birgit saw, and it was goat. <laughs> So we did many other things like drawing extraordinary nice goat images and collecting them. And also, you know, Wiki love. We will, we also love goats. Very soon coming next week. <laughs> you already saw the goat sniffer, so. But this is the new Huggle logo. You can very soon detect when you go and use Huggle. Yeah, thanks, Ed Goat, for that. Um, also, we have uh, a conspiracy going on, but there is no conspiracy. Goats, goats are not evil. Goats are the good ones. And um, Mark Ockerbloom did a nice GIF, animated GIF. That's really awesome. More of it, more of it. Goat for that. Goat for that. Yeah, um, so we also uh, developed a plan for the GOAT Movement Strategy 2027 <laughs> because 2027 is the year of the GOAT. Um, it's a long way to GOAT, but you know, it's going to be great. Thank you. So, so everybody is up to speed now on the Godification project, right? This was the big thing. Um, C. Scott is next um, on uh, JSON, LD, and image annotation. Um, he introduced it to me as I have nothing to say because this is a back-end, back-end thing. Um, I still, I managed to uh, convince him that uh, it would be interesting to uh, tell you something about it. Yeah, you didn't tell me I'd be following the goats, though. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll, uh, I'll uh, preface this by saying uh, this is, yeah, back end, back end. I've got no, well, I, I told t I had no pretty pictures to show, and so you're after a, a presentation which is like nothing but pretty pictures. <laughs> um, let's see. Give me one second here. Um, while you're fixing that, Lena. We're looking for Lena on the visual categories. Please report. With Rachel? Oh boy. Well, uh, that might work. That doesn't look quite right, but sure. Let's pretend you can see it. It's a tiny, tiny window of my screen, but uh, I've got good eyes. Um, OK, so, um, so the goal, there's an extension that um, uh, Mark Holmquist wrote as part of the multimedia team for file annotations or image annotations. Um, and the idea is to actually do semantic markup of images, so not just uh, this is an image of, of Douglas Adams, but like Wikidata affide. This region of the image is an image of Wikidata item Q42, which can be then translated in all sorts of languages. And Wikidata has a whole set of really interesting properties. Uh, you can you know describe which region of this image is an image of a gravestone, or an image of a location, or um, or a gargoyle on a larger image, or whatever whatever you want. So. Um, Proper credit to uh, to Mark for getting uh, for getting that off the ground. Um, I went to an image uh, an annotations conference uh, a uh, a couple months ago. Well, I can't see where that went. Um, uh, and we're just gonna rent. Oh gosh. Um, well, uh, so I'll just say, uh, so this is a, I got an a interaction designer from NPR to uh, contribute a really nice UI for like how this should work in the ideal case. And he outlined a whole bunch of improvements to uh, the existing ex image uh, What's annotation a UI? extension. What? What's a UI? Uh, user experience, user interface. Um, so a number of things about, uh, uh, you know, it's really tiny, right? But here's an image of, of a city, and you're annotating regions on it, and then you, uh, 
uh, you click to add a new annotation, and it gives you this beautiful Wikidata-fied drop-down box where you can select the specific thing that you're looking for. And then the next one, which is way too small for you to see, uh, lets you select a particular Wikidata uh, property to associate with that. Um, so that's all, that's all really cool. Um, here's uh, sort of what it looks like in practice on my current uh, test wiki. Um, so I can add an annotation and say that this region of this image is uh, Douglas Adams. And so here, what I would really like to do is start typing Douglas Adams and have it associate with the Wikidata stuff, but that's as far as I got during the hackathon, and getting Wikidata installed beat me. Um, uh, but um, yeah, so you know, if, if it was Wikidata, this is Q42 is Douglas Adams, and you can look and see all the interesting prop there. There are some properties already about image, and there's even a grave uh, stone image link in here. Um, and the, the, the really invisible part, which is what I spent most of my time on, there's this huge long W3C standard for what the JSON for a proper image annotation thing should look like. And so I packed the, patched the back end of Wikidata to make it output beautiful JSON LD so that in some future, form, uh, future life, once the actual front end gets beautiful and working, we will be W3C compliant in our image annotations. Um, uh, yeah, there you go. Beautiful. That part I can't show you, though. Thank you, Scott. Yeah. I'll say. Uh, that's the part that works, and that's the part I can't show you. <laughs> uh, we're also looking for the, um, Aaron Ross uh, on MW Wikibase get best statements. Oh, we found him. OK. Yes. Next is um, Ed Johnston. I'm Ed Johnston, and the other people who worked on this were uh, user WBM1058 and uh, Bartos, that is Matt Marex, is the person who did all the actual coding work. There he is in the orange. Thank you. And uh, the complaint was originally opened back in 2013, and uh, it managed to get closed during this hackathon by a fortuitous uh, coincidence of several people who all knew about it who were willing to work on it all at the same time. And uh, it appears to be about uh, the special pages, special permalink, and special diff. And the underlying issue is really uh, not enough room in edit summaries. And so you can stuff more characters into an edit summary if you can somehow compress the message that you were trying to give. And if the original message you are trying to give happened to involve a pointer to a piece of code or to a notice board discussion, then it would naturally be a diff. So who is going to stuff all 150 characters or whatever of a diff into their edit summary to explain what it is that they just did? Well, most people won't be able to do that. And, however, if you manage to compress what you're trying to say by, let's see, there doesn't seem to be a, oh, there it is. OK. If, you, if, if what you're trying to say happens to be easily representable by a diff, you can uh, provide an invocation of special diff right in the summary, and you can actually pipe it to something else, like a few meaningful words. And let me show you an example of that actually being done. Here's, uh, here's uh, let's see. All right. In the move log, you will perhaps, if you happen to look in my move log from 26 July, you'll see that I did the daring step of uh, promoting this article from small letters to capital letters, obviously a very important improvement. And then the word requested is underlined. And well, in a Google Doc, clicking on requested won't do anything. And the actual log, you can click on requested and it will expand out into a actual uh, page of the requested move, uh, technical requests page, where this request was entered by JAX 0677. So 
In this case, the improvement is rather trivial because that's just the single word capitalization is entered as the reason for doing the move. But you can imagine with a complex thing, or it could be even a summary for why so-and-so ought to be blocked indefinitely. And so clicking on a single word in the log will take you directly to the rationale. And should you be an administrator trying to look into the record of somebody who is alleged to have misbehaved, but you're not really sure why, and uh, three years ago, some administrator that's not around anymore did something, if they happens to have put into the log uh, this reference to the actual discussion, it, it could be very helpful. And in terms of the mechanics of doing this, uh, there's rather a long story, but the uh, special permanent link and special diff are very valuable, and now they're somewhat appropriately documented, and the improvement uh, to Wikipedia, the English Wikipedia is supposed to be in there in about two weeks. So thanks, Bartosz. Thank you. <laughs> Next is uh, Aaron Helfacker on Oris Thresholds. I think you're, you have a link here somewhere. Go ahead. OK. All right. Uh, so I'm going to demonstrate something that's uh, not very visual. I'm going to try and use closed source software to open a bunch of things. And yeah, I figured it out. OK. There we go. All right. So this is, this is really actually a demo that's targeted uh, primarily at Roan and the collaboration team. But before I say anything, I got to tell you that I worked with uh, Justin Du on this project. Excellent uh, contributor, very happy to see him here. Worked with him at the uh, Vienna Hackathon too, and so regretfully he had to take off for his flight. Um, so we worked on ORS. Uh, ORS is something that you might have heard about. Um, uh, it's a machine learning service. One of the things that I'm really excited about with ORS is doing better at reporting how our models work and how people can use our models from a machine readable perspective. So if you're building a tool that uses ORS and you're using it to say catch vandalism, you know what sort of operational concerns you're interacting with when you set a certain threshold. So ORS currently, this is actually the, the production version of ORS right now. If you would like to set a particular threshold, oh, look at that, that's cute JSON. Um, then you would go to uh, the particular endpoint for that model. So for example, the damaging model. And you can ask it for some uh, model information. Uh, and it will report a giant block of content. And so uh, one thing that uh, we, we've had to sort of resort to doing was putting lots of these statistics called filterate at recall and uh, setting different values. There's also uh, recall at precision. And there's just a bunch of these test statistics. Each one of these represents some threshold optimization of making sure that, you know, set your threshold here for ORS confidence, and it will have these sort of operational concerns. The collaboration team kept coming to me over and over again. Can you add another threshold? Can you add another threshold? And the answer is I was yes. But after a while, we realized there's got to be a better way to do this. And so that better way of, to do this now actually works. So here's a nice, cute little experimental version of ORS. Same sort of thing, just a, a different, um, whoops, just a different uh, server that it's running from. We're just about ready to deploy this. It's, uh, it's a really big change. But I'm going to pull up uh, practically the same endpoint here. Damaging, and I'm going to ask for model information. Um, but what you won't see in this list, well, what you will see is actually there's a lot more information in here. Um, you can dig into the machine that was actually built on. There's a lot more information about the parameters that the model was constructed. But then when you look at statistics, you won't see any of those threshold optimization things. It's just like the basic statistics of the classifier, these FPRs and match rates and PRAUCs and precisions. There's no notion of these optimizations. And uh, so I imagine this is probably making the collaboration team a little bit nervous because they need these things. Um, so what we implemented is you can actually dig into the model information in a much more nuanced way. Let's say I just want to know about the environment. Cool, that's all I have output. We can do the environment. And actually, I just want to know the machine that was built on. OK, we've got that. But I actually want to know something about the statistics. And I want to dig into the thresholds. And I would like to make a true prediction. And I would like the maximum recall at precision. Oops at precision greater than or equal to 0 
and we'll get a big error. <laughs> and I will check what I did wrong. Oh, I forgot a space. And there we go. You can set any arbitrary uh, optimization that you like. What do you think, Rowan? All right, thanks. Thank you, thank you Aaron. Uh, we have a few more presentations. Um, there's a person with the name Braveheart. Can you please report to Rachel? Do you have VGA? Yeah. Okay. You, you don't have HDMI? No. Okay. So uh, it's happened? Yeah. Okay. Uh, hi, I'm Iran. Uh, I, I, I uh, worked on improving the Wikidata usage tracking. Uh, who, uh, who men helped me. So I will show the w one subtask that I worked on. So basically, now that we are using more Wikidata, uh, we want to track the changes in Wikidata. And so we open the watch list and uh, enable, uh, Wikidata and, uh, enable Wikidata in the watch list. What we see now in the watch list is many, uh, uh, many changes from Wikidata that are not really, re not really relevant to the, page, uh, to the page. So we want to improve the, uh, the usage tracking of Wikidata. So only statements that are actually used in the page will be shown in the recent changes in the and in the watch list. So this is, the this is a, a query on the, data on the production database of uh, Hebrew Wikipedia. And as you can see here, uh, this is the, the tracking of uh, Wikidata usage. Most of the usages are something. It's, it's unknown, X. We don't know what is actually used in the page. So whatever uh, is changed in the Wikidata item, uh, it's shown in the recent changes. And we want to track only the specific lines that are used. Uh, so there is a new uh, change in the uh, wiki base uh, in evaluation that uh, you can now, it now tracks uh, specific properties. So for example, if we uh, use uh, property number two, uh, it knows, uh, the database knows that in this page, uh, only property two is relevant. So I added a new uh, Lua uh, interface of a wiki base get based uh, statements where you give it entity and a uh, property and property and you can uh, use specific uh, statement without loading the whole entity uh, this will, will will allow us to later on track only properties that are actually used in the article uh, that's, that's it about the specific, uh, the specific uh, subtask. It's a part of a, more, uh, of a more general task of improving the tracking uh, usage, and you can follow this uh, fabricator task to see more changes that uh, we hopefully will get soon. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now we have uh, Wikidataheim by... Uh, uh, yeah. We, uh, sorry, sorry, Wiki Daheim. <laughs> Muscle memory. <laughs> HDMI? HDMI. Here it is. I think I put it here somewhere. Hi, uh, my name is Philip Kopetsky. Um, next to me is Simon Legner. We're both from Austria. And over the last few months, we've been working on a project um, that I'll show in a moment. So we have all these lists on, on Wikipedia about like natural monuments. And this is like the, the, the natural, uh, not the natural, natural mon monuments and also monuments. And this is the monuments list of Hallstatt, which is a World Heritage site. 
And we thought, like, this is a bit of a difficult way to um, display this information to, especially to newcomers, because it's, it's a wiki table, and wiki tables are notoriously difficult to, to edit. So we thought we would um, build a new platform that can aggregate all this data and display it in an interesting way. So um, that is Wiki Daheim. So, and you can now put in a name, or the name of a village, like Karlstadt, for example. And then you get um, a list of all the monuments, all the nature in there, uh, all the public arts, and also some common infrastructure in, in that village. Um, yeah, and then you can also like uh, filter certain images. You can also um, filter nature and other things. Um, yeah, uh, that's the that's the feature itself, um, or the, the website itself. And for this hackathon, we've done some improvements, which um, uh, Simon will now present. Uh, so besides the national uh, list of monuments, one part of Austria, namely Tyrol, also uh, publishes uh, uh, a separate catalog on mostly public art. Some of it is also part of the uh, official monuments. And um, we would also like to uh, get Wikipedians to take photos of those uh, additional objects. Uh, and for that, we included this uh, called Kunstkataster to the platform in, during the hackathon. So um, what we added is uh, this uh, link to the Kunstkataster, where people are, uh, where uh, uh, dialogue opens with an access to the Kunstkataster, and then people are get a, a list of uh, like all objects in this uh, uh, catalog. Uh, they click on an item here, paste, uh, paste the link back to the, the form and then it can open the upload wizard. So why have we done this so complicated? The reason is that the, the list isn't uh, a, a public data or something similar, so we had to do this uh, detour via like, asking people to open it. And we did some additional improvements on colors and, and some spacing and so on. Thank you. And uh, when can people use this immediately or? Yes, yeah, so it has been uh, online since uh, the end of July. So what, if you come to Austria and um, you want to see what you can take pictures of or write articles about, um, you can use the website to, to get that information. Great, thank you. Thank you. you. Uh, next we have Sage Ross on program and events dashboard improvements. Hello, uh, I'm Sejal Khatri, and I'm a cu current Google Summer of Code intern, uh, working under the amazing mentorship of Sage Ross. Uh, I work on the programs and events dashboard. It's basically the outreach dashboard uh, for uh, easing the progress tra tracking of the Wikimedia program programs, including uh, the, uh, which include the editing Wikipedia. So, uh, okay, sorry. <laughs> It's been um, so few days back. I was uh, working on making the dashboard uh, mobile friendly, and um, so I, there's this component sidebar React component called uh, React Burger menu, and um, so I was working on integrating it with the dashboard to make it uh, mobile friendly. Um, so this is the current uh, version of the. Wikidu dashboard, and uh, during the uh, I had some progress on the dashboard, but during the hackathon, I made the final changes. Uh, so this is how it is. Uh, um, it looks currently, and uh, so it works on Chrome and Firefox, but uh, there are a few changes to be made to make it work on Safari. So I also worked on checking uh, what was actually failing, and so I have figured out uh, that there are few CSS. Um, clashes which are happening between our CSS and the React Burger menu CSS. Um, 
uh, that's about it. I, so I have to yet work on making it accessible on Safari, but so yeah, that, 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 that's my work. Thank you. So this is a change I ask to Vicky Education team because I must track uh, uh, an event. So I must know uh, not only uh, the revision uh, made by a username, but also made uh, uh, related to the articles uh, they are assigned to them. Uh, to them. So uh, for this, we, we made another module. Uh, it's available here. I must uh, join the program. How can I change? Ah, ah you said it. So uh, uh, first was uh, uh, an article was uh, where uh, a number, a major number, because uh, it keep a trace about uh, uh, all the revisions of uh, the username. Then we put another another program, another module named Article Scoped Program, uh, and uh, a change uh, the option. On the combo box, uh, we, we change on, uh, on this new model and we track uh, on the, uh, the, the result related to these uh, uh, articles. It's important because in this uh, case, uh, the results are real results, are related only uh, for this event. And it's important uh, uh, when uh, someone uh, asks for a grant because it, uh, it can use as a matrix. So for us, it's very important. And it's a work in progress because uh, the next step is to uh, trace the retentions. So if uh, people stay on the articles, if people uh, continue to change, continue to discuss about these uh, articles, and uh, so uh, it's everything available. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sage. Okay. Um, then we have Fortis. Uh, yeah, with uh, the comments Android app got fixed. HDMI? Yeah. Okay. Can you please start the clock? Okay, so uh, right now, uh, when a user took a photo of, uh, inside the uh, Commons app, the and the upload for some reason failed, uh, the the photo that the user took would be forever lost. So, uh, what I did uh, was uh, add the option in the settings for the user to use the external storage, and when taking uh, photos from inside the app, uh, saving them on the phone's memory. So. When the user uh, reaches the screen, uh, uh, the photo would be already uh, saved on the inter uh, internal uh, storage space. And the, if the upload failed, the user could try again, or uh, they might like to use the picture for some other reason. Thank you. Thank you. OK, then we.